So welcome everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Grand Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschler, I'm the director of the Siegel Center. It's day five of the Prelude Festival here. We had over 40 presentations um, in the last days. Great companies like Elevator Repair Service, Richard Maxwell, Major Theater of Oklahoma. The, the, we had a great dance, Raja, Heather Kelly was here, and we passed many, many discussions also, many panels. And today I, is a day where we focus a bit on the exchange of academia and the New York theater scene on many uh, levels. It's about uh, uh, space um, and New York, about performance and responsibility um, for performance. It uh, will be um, about uh, many things. We think one of the important questions what we now have also is how does academia react? What do we do? How does it observe? And today, at the very beginning, um, for our viewers also on HowlRound, we have a, a panel on device the theater. We have Alan Kohaski with us, and he brought his team. They did an, an extensive research over 12 days of so the National Endowment of Humanities Art, and they're going to give us a report on this, I feel, most uh, important subject because it also co covers ensemble theater, dance, and also, of course, device and theater, the term that is uh, an umbrella for, for many things. So I would like to welcome all of you to come here, and Alan, I hope I'm giving it over to you. Thank you. Great. And, and thank you to Frank and his wonderful staff for putting this all together. It happened on uh, short notice to everybody, and they did a great job. And um, the invitation was really meaningful to us, and also for the flexibility around our schedules and for this being part of the Prelude Festival kind of promotion. It's great. Um, and I want to thank all everyone here for also being available to come. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce everyone, but detailed biographies of all the speakers today are on the Prelude Festival events uh, website. So I'm just going to give you the essentials, but you can find more there. And I think it's going to be up for a while, if not forever. Um, so um, I'm Alan Kowarski, and I'm currently a senior research scholar in the Department of Theater at Swarthmore College. And I teach in, in the Pig Iron Theater Company's MFA program in device performance, which is something I've been doing for the last 10, 11 years. Uh, with Quinn Bowerdell, who is co-founder and co-artistic director of Pig Iron Theater Company and the director of the School of Device Performance. Uh, I served as co-director of the 2023 NEH Institute uh, in Philadelphia titled Preserving and Transmitting American Ensemble-Based Device Theater. And I want to make sure Quinn could we we hope Quinn would be able to be with us today. He couldn't, and Quinn should be given a shout out as the person who actually came with the original impulse and idea. The original idea came from his side, and then he came to me and asked me to partner with him. And so it's very interesting to think about someone really coming from the practice and the artistic side and not based in uh, the more academic side of higher education, uh, who, whose brainstorm really led to all of this um, starting. And we also did that proposal, the original proposal on very short notice. and. Uh, and got the funding successfully nonetheless. So um, we were really uh, proud and uh, pleased that it all worked out that way. Um, so let me start uh, with our panelists who are here. And then there are um, two ways people are represented today on the panel. Uh, three of the people were what we call participants in the NEH Institute. And in an NEH Institute, there are people who are funded by the grant, fully funded. They shouldn't have to absorb any expenses for participation, and they do the entire 12-day ride. Uh, and it's a very intense commitment that requires an, uh, uh, unbroken attendance for 12 days. And then there are faculty, and the faculty come and go, and are there sometimes for just a day, some opted to stay longer at their own expense and to observe and be uh, able to take in more of the content of the Institute. Um, and then there are the organizers from the Pig Iron School. And um, in total, the, it was a gathering of 50 people involved with the teaching of theater and higher education who have interest in devising physically based work and ensemble based work. And in the case of Wright Gentleman in particular, it was part of our uh, very high priority for us in the proposal language to include archiving. And that we have Wright here. Wright was the person we were able to have in the cohort whose full time work is with uh, archiving and. Library really in home education. So, um, so we have people here who are representing, who are here as participants. And then we also have uh, Tom Seller, who was actually on the faculty. And so we had a session that was devoted to 
uh, editors and publication. And we had, as part of the proposal for the uh, institute from the beginning, we had a prior agreement with Tom and Theater, the Theater Magazine at Yale, that they would dedicate space in a future issue to uh, writing coming out of the institute. And that is happening. So yeah, there will be an entire issue of theater published in May, where the entire content will be from the participants, uh, not the fact that the participants of uh, the Institute, along with Quinn Bowen and myself as so organizers. And then Rebecca Adelsheim, who's here, is uh, a co-editor on the theater magazine, but was also a participant in the Institute. So uh, they did the entire ride of the 12 days, uh, and Tom was there but for one day in a way typical of the faculty. So it's these different ways of people coming in and out. Okay, so the, 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 just the fuller introductions uh, without everything that's on the website. Uh, Tracy Hazas is an actor and movement director. She has performed at New York City theaters, including New York City Center, Dixon Place, Adrian's Art Center, and Theater for the New City. Uh, and most recently, she was seen in Preparedness, co-produced by the Bushwick Star and Here Art Center. Uh, Hazas is an affiliated artist with the Counterbalance Theater. She teaches performance movement, collaboration, and voice at Queens College in the CUNY system. And previous academic positions have included lecture of acting and movement at Stanford University and work at Emerson College, Los Angeles, Montclair State University, New Jersey, and others. Right gentleman uh, on my right is a librarian for the performing arts in the division of libraries in the Tisch Group of the Arts at New York University. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Minnesota Theater Arts and Dance Department uh, and an MLIS, a Master's of Library and Information Science. My husband has that degree uh, from San Jose State University. Uh, gentleman conducts research at the intersection of performance studies, transgender studies, and new media studies. His dissertation-based book project explores the ways the transgender embodiment is conceptualized in and shaped by digital media. He is also currently working as contributor and co-editor on an anthology focused on trans feminist theater and performance. Uh, Rebecca Adelsheim, on my far right, is a doctoral candidate in dramaturgy and dramatic criticism at the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale University, where they study queer theater and performance. They are also a lecturer at Tufts University. Their writing has been published in Theater Magazine, where they also serve as the associate editor. Rebecca is originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and received their BA from the University of Pennsylvania and their MFA from the Yale School of Drama. And Tom Seller, far left, uh, is a writer, curator, and dramaturg, uh, editor of Theater Magazine, long serving editor of Theater Magazine, and professor in the practice of dramaturgy, the practice of dramaturgy and dramatic criticism at Yale University. His writing and criticism have appeared in national publications, including Art Forum, Bomb, The New York Times, The Guardian, Four Columns, and American Theater. From 2001 to 2016, he was a frequent contributor to The Village Voice, where he covered theater and performance art nationally, serving as an Obie Award judge, and for two teams as chief theater critic. Um, so that's our, that's our cohort. And I just want to share a few words about uh, the, the Institute, uh, how it was framed, and a little bit about what an NDH Institute represents and, and how um, and to encourage others to think about organizing them in the field of fields of human performance sites, because they've been kind of a dormant practice that we found out by doing it. The past, present, and future of the biased physical theater in the US was the topic of an historic NDH Institute in Philadelphia this past June. A diverse group of over 50 professors, artists, teachers, grad students, editors, and archivists from around the country, as well as several foreign countries, gathered for 12 days of rigorous discussion on the issues of archiving, criticism, and especially the theoretical and historical uh, framing and teaching of the 60-year-old practice in American and world theater. This exchange was prompted by the recent proliferation of the teaching of the practice of devising in colleges, universities, and drama schools often without a theoretical, critical, historical framing, and took place in the context of the larger challenges to such innovative life performance in the U.S. following the COVID epidemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the growing impact of climate change. And of course, not just in the United States. Um, these factors are all in play. Uh, while the participants here today are practical necessity from the New York 
Philadelphia facility, it is important to note that the mission of the Institute and the charge we had from NEH was for this to be a national gallery. And with broad, broad, with broad geographical and institutional representation, as well as with participants from every phase of career development in the field, ranging from graduate students like Rebecca uh, to late career scholars and artists. Um, the profile of the 25 funded participants was also often interdisciplinary, including colleagues in dance, visual art, media, and comparative literature. The scope of the artistic practices considered in the Institute were also defined as national in nature, with the goal of making visible work in a wide variety of locations in the country uh, over time, including regional hubs of such activities in cities such as Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, Minneapolis, and San Francisco. And of course, there are very robust examples of individual companies working in places like Austin or Albuquerque or Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, and there's a very dearth of critical literature on many of these companies that have very significant and sustained histories. Alongside the 25 committed participants were 20 faculty who led a variety of seminars and workshops over the 12 days, as well as a half dozen graduate students and staff members from the Pig Iron School. The presence of all participants, faculty, and support staff from Pig Iron were funded by the grant from NEH which was the, the only such institute in the country funded this year with a focus on contemporary theater. Uh, these grants are highly competitive to receive and the selection process for the participants was similarly highly selected. We could only accept one out of four applications to be participants. Um, last month, Frank Hensher, uh, Hensher generously uh, reached out to us to consider this work as part of a, such a conversation about device theater after COVID. While the pandemic, which is ongoing, was an undeniable context for our gathering, it was never explicitly the focus of our sessions on the past, present, and future of device to in the United States, and in particular its presence in higher education. But it was always one way or another present. So I suggested to our speakers that they gather their thoughts about the following. Uh, what your concerns and interests uh, about device physical ensemble theater were, were coming into the Institute in June. Uh, what you gained from the intense public experience in the group, what you came away with that was not there when you arrived. And what you see and experience as the challenges and opportunities for such work now and in the future, especially in regard to higher education's role uh, in this work. And uh, I think it is also important that our discussion emphasize, is also important that our discussion emphasize the national global framing of our talking points in the Institute at Philadelphia, with the local defined as our given local academic teaching situation, wherever that was or wherever that is. Um, and the one thing that we emphasized over and over again, and it came up, I said, I was talking about even the language for promoting today's panel with Frank, is it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, and it's one of these things we always want to edit down, but the fullness of the theme was threefold to start. Um, so devised, physically based, ensemble based, in combinations. And then that expanded to include interdisciplinary performance, global performance, and um, uh, inter interdisciplinary performance, global performance, and um, applied performance. Right? So we, we in, the, in the end, we had almost six talking points, at least six talking points, but we began with those three and their interconnectedness. Right? So um, if the issues of the theater in the context of COVID are important to you on the panel, or those of you who, when we get to the question and discussion and answering these questions, then they are great for us to hear your thoughts about all that along the way, but it's really, we want to hear first about the Institute, uh, what's foremost in your mind at this point, going forward. So, so I know who would like to start. Maybe. I'll jump in, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I was delighted to, I was just like, what is Pig Iron up to? Um, um, so I just went to Pig Iron site and was delighted to learn about this Institute, which I felt, address directly what you know these questions that I've had for I don't know five years I just like how do I as a person who teaches uh acting multiple levels of movement for theater uh and courses in collaboration and devising how do I get better at what I do um 
by becoming more aware of other things that are happening in the field, other questions that are arising for other scholars or teaching artists in this area. Um, how can I give my students access to what's going on in the field, especially in an environment of austerity in which um, uh, many of my students have never been to a theater uh, when they begin uh, training with me, uh, much less ensemble theater. So I feel a great responsibility to, um, beyond what I'm teaching them in the studio, uh, try to, how can I make them, or how can I allow them to be conversant in what's happening right now in theater? Uh, it remains a question, but I, so I, I'm just so excited that this exists and hope that it can continue in the future iterations of it. Um, so that was what brought me to it. Uh, and I was really surprised by the great inspiration and validation that I found by being with these other scholars and teaching artists um, uh, and kind of becoming aware um, of my experience of, in any department and in theater departments can sometimes be small and filled with overworked people. <laughs> um, who, uh, so even though uh, a number of us may be working on devised practices, devising practices in our, in our coursework, it's how can we reach each other and be sure that our courses are speaking to each other and things like this. So became aware of like, oh wow, I in a way have felt that I'm working in a vacuum. I think this also is a reality for um, movement practitioners who are often brought on as part-time faculty. Um, and so that, that is my past. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was incredibly inspiring to be um, surrounded by everyone. All of these, all these folks who were so interested and dedicated in this work and it was so uh, inspiring. And that is, it, it's like reaffirming your own commitment to it. And there's no greater driver um, uh, to me, as I, you know, as I get back into the studio this semester with students, it's, it I just have so much more energy um, to try to push this work forward. My open thoughts, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, then just to say one of the things that we emphasized in the grant proposal and in the, the as a consistent theme throughout the institute was how the discussions can lead to innovations in the university, college, and drama school curriculum. And particularly on the academic side, the theoretical, historical, critical curriculum to inform the practice, which is proliferating widely in teaching, but without necessarily uh, a grounding in the knowledge of the history and um, larger uh, yeah, historical and cultural context. So, yeah, you know, all those things. Yeah. Um, great. Um, Maybe sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that the Institute was sort of two separate perspectives. The first was as an editor, we knew that we were going to be doing a special issue. And for me, I think the writing around device and company creative theater has been relatively narrow, at least the, the writing that I've encountered. And I was curious what ideas folks would have in terms of how we expand those perspectives, how we include all of the richness and capaciousness of device theater into how we talk about it and how we teach it. So I was mostly just curious about what that conversation would be like and how we would how we would find each other in terms of writing partners or or folks who would be interested in contributing to this issue. And then the second is as an artist and a scholar, my work is really around queer theater and performance, which to me has always fell into the category of devised and complete creative theater, both aesthetically and in terms of practice, but is not something that's commonly talked about in, in the language of device theater. So I was curious how we would open up that particular portal into the world of, of queer theater and performance. Um, and then at the Institute, I was equally really inspired by everyone's curiosity and focus on this topic. And also I think I found those conspirators or collaborators, both as an editor and as, as folks interested in queer theater and performance. So, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be one of those collaborators. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, what drew me to the institute? I, I was thinking, um, you know, I, I, my practice encompasses um, librarianship, scholarship, um, and uh, more so in the past uh, practice. Um, so I came to the institute kind of in librarian frame, um, and noticing that you know. The faculty and the students I worked with were coming to me more and more with questions about device theater um, or ensemble based or collective creation. 
and I wanted to be able to be a better librarian. Right? Um, so that's kind of what drew me to the Institute. Um, what I gained, I'll just, I just need a second what everyone else has said, is that it was a, it was a really incredible experience, um, in large part because uh, the group of the 25 of us um, just brought so many different perspectives and brought such energy and such curiosity uh, to the conversations we had. It was really um, stimulating inspire, inspiring to have those conversations uh, between us. And I think the last part of your question. Um, uh, what do you see as challenges and opportunities going forward? Yeah, so I think also thinking um, in, in a librarian sense, um, a lot of what I gained from the Institute and what I hope to see going forward um, are more uh, more materials available for uh, teaching and scholarship in libraries, right? So building library collections, building bibliographies um, around this kind of work, um, which we started doing during the institute, which I think was a really um, cool uh, minor project we worked on together. Um, and I also, I think the other thing that's moving forward for me is, is this group, we were, we were talking earlier about how our WhatsApp chat is still really, really active. Um, we've not stopped being engaged with each other, right? And, and we are working on projects together. Um, we're we're co-writing essays. We are um, possibly co-presenting, you know, working groups at conferences. Um, I, I, think, I think going forward, I'm just really curious to see how this group starts to articulate um, what, 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 is the, what the importance is of device theater going forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, and um, Tom, you're coming in in a different, on a different footing, but also in a very informed way about the, the bigger context of the field and work in the country and globally. So I'm just kind of curious to hear, and also you've been seeing things we have yet to see, all the materials that have come in from the participants that will uh, make the material of this. There will be an entire issue now, I guess, uh, of material coming out of the Institute. So, um, Coming into it as you have, which was as one of the, the faculty speaking just for one day and not there for the entire journey, but talking, I assume, a lot with Rebecca and then looking at the written material. Um, what's coming together in your understanding of this and the issues and that the COVID situation is um, a useful, meaningful, you know, kind of hook on which to make your point. So great. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be back at Prairie, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for this invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, I was only at the suit for a day, but I could um, feel immediately walking into the room that it was a very energized room. Uh, you can sense these things right away, and I was very happy about that. Um, I had instinctively committed to doing an issue of Yale's Journal of Theater. Um, as soon as Alan mentioned that they were undertaking this project, because I thought, um, have thought for a long time as a critic, that um, this is a very um, underappreciated, um, underrecognized, um, but very artistically exciting sector of the American theater in particular. Um, what groups can do, um, working on their own terms um, as collectives, as ensembles, um, detached, semi detached from uh, kind of producing hierarchies and mechanisms uh, that you find in kind of institutional theater. Um, is very interesting, and I think has been um, has been the incubator for a lot of the most important American work that I've seen uh, in my whatever it's now thirty years of writing about theater and making theater. Um, and I was interested in the question of the, the legacy um, of the um, uh, essential ensembles from the sixties, eighties. Um, and also the question of what might be coming next, how we might expand our understanding of devised theater or collective creation um, to um, look at a much wider spectrum of work or a, a historical moment where we're really reassessing um, our whole understanding of theater history. Um, I think across the academy, there's a lot of um, intention to um, center BIPOC work and career work in particular that may have gotten overlooked, um, and I was interested in how this institute might shed light on both of those questions. What is the inheritance um, on one hand, and what can we learn from it, and how can that empower us um, at a time when very few people pay attention to history <laughs> uh, or have learned about it? Uh, and on the other hand, um, how looking forward um, that might be, um, we might be able to um, change the course of it and make it uh, an exciting um, vehicle and sector. 
So one of the things that's interesting about a magazine, like ours, is that a magazine is both a kind of repository <laughs> um, and it also creates a sense of what's happening right now or what is um, what is in the process of forming. It's kind of forward looking at the same time. So this was in a way a perfect project for a publication because on one hand, um, it is a documentation of some of the work, the conversations that were had in the Institute. And on the other hand, um, it is a space where everyone who has been participating in these conversations for 12 days to um, begin to work out uh, some of the questions that you all were thinking about while you were there. So I hope that the essays, uh, forums, uh, the um, recorded dialogues that people have been working on will um, be what gets you um, to the next place, the next stage in your thinking. So uh, you can watch out for that issue. It's um, going to be finished uh, and published in May, May 2024. Uh, and will be available both online and in print. Uh, you can go to our website at theatermagazine.org uh, and uh, pre-order your copy now so that when <laughs> that beautiful uh, that beautiful publication is ready, uh, have a copy. Yeah, and we are, um, the way that the NEH institutes work is they are potentially repeatable. Um, but they can only be repeated in the alternating years. So you have to complete um, uh, kind of reporting and everything back on the event. And we will, we intend to apply to repeat the uh, Institute in uh, June, 2025. So it would then, if we we're lucky, we'll be able to uh, do a second iteration of it uh, as soon as uh, 2025. And then we've heard uh, and, uh, in some of our meetings from people who've done Institutes that have gone up to six or eight iterations. So that would be very exciting. But um, we'll see if we have a standing for all that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's that's in our thinking already. And um, one of the things that uh, Tracy brought up, which I think is you know, there, there are many, many apparent contradictions or paradoxes in this work that come up very quickly, like the, the issue of students who are <laughs> teaching students who have not yet had the the access to theater in general, and then what seems like a pretty esoteric category on first contact, and is it in fact a more accessible form of theater to introduce less privileged students to, or is it um, more distant and uh, uh, harder to understand access and make appropriate? And one of the things that started the Institute off very powerfully, I felt, was uh, the kind of keynote speaker of the Institute was Mike Manning, who will of the University of Wisconsin, who was responsible for some of the real foundational books uh, providing kind of a foundational survey of the history of the practice in the United States. And the word that he used that I keep circling around in my own thoughts is precarity. And that uh, how uh, we're including, if this is I think where the COVID question comes in and it seems extremely immediate, maybe right now with the end of federal funding that kept many theaters going in spite of the COVID, um, stresses on audiences and budgets and operations that once that scene is no longer necessary or the government no longer has the um, commitment to continue that funding, what we're finding is an extraordinary vulnerability of many organizations that is revealed only when we're actually seemingly perhaps feeling like the past COVID though, in fact, not that um, the government funding is being withdrawn nonetheless, and therefore uh, weaknesses in the infrastructure of all kinds of things are being revealed. So that may be where the COVID um, situation is most apparent all around and it's hitting every kind of organization from, you know, we just had up, you know, 180 degree turns with the Under the Radar Festival that it was gone and now it's back. It's, we heard that a few days ago, it's back. Um, and a lot of other kind of dramatic news in the world about organizations, the Del Arte Company and school in California, and they have a representative in the Institute has just announced that they will probably be folding by the end of the year. So that's a big loss uh, on another uh, front. And then and we found out by having to be a national gathering, and I think it's really important to point out that some of the most important things happening nationally are in state universities, not on the coasts. And that there are very large, significant operations, well-funded, large student enrollment, um, adding tenure lines, for example, in devising. 
So there is good news in the country or hope, hopeful signs in the country, but you have to really look at all the data and look broadly and then look at the nuances. So by having people there from, say, Ball State University, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, from the University of Washington at Seattle, we found that there are, in fact, pretty interesting um, movements forward, <clears throat> specific to devising physically based like ensemble based teaching. So there are um, interesting things moving in different parts of the country that might need to be missed if you don't take in the bigger, the bigger scope. Um, and so, yeah, I think one of the contradictions, and maybe this is back to why we have, uh, at least today, you know, such uh, uh, the queer representation that we have in the student among other categories of representation in the student is, again, is this a, a form of theater that serves well the interests of certain communities, um, such as ones that are part of the research. Yeah, I'd like to jump in and tie maybe a few things together that we're talking about. I'm also going to start with the COVID question. Um, and say that in addition to things like funding, which are of course very important, um, like another thing that COVID brings up for me is that I can't really think COVID without thinking about racial justice uprisings, about thinking about George Floyd's George murder. I can't really think COVID without thinking about the ramifications of the U.S.'s um, lurch toward authoritarianism that was, you know, playing out in a particularly acute way um, at the height of the COVID crisis. Um, and I bring all of this up because I think when we're thinking about what, what the history of the theater is and what its future is, I think the answers to that might be one and the same. I think that in the, something that we're trying to do in, in the essay that we're writing is to broaden um, how we think about the histories of, of device theater to include practices that have been happening for a very, very long time, including practices that precede the sort of uh, uh, 60s to 80s moment that we most commonly associate with the dawn of device theater. Um, I think not only about queer practices that pre exist that, but I also think about, um, I was just uh, doing some research around the African Road Theater, which was the first all-black theater company in the US, um, here in New York, and a lot of the way that they presented plays was by taking the play and kind of like subverting it, kind of devising it, redoing it to, because you know, all the plays available to them were of course like written from a really white supremacist like framework, right? And so they're taking these plays and they're kind of completely throwing away the script and saying, let's do it this way in a way that like points to like, like you know, like visions of black power versus like this white supremacist, you know. Um, so I guess the answer I might have and how this is relevant for classrooms today um, is that this has always been really, um, I, for me, when I think about the history of my theater, it has always come out of this kind of this, this radical place and this place of um, pushing back against particular kinds of oppressions that you know far pre-exist in the 1960s. And I think that's I think reaching back into those histories allows us to see a little more easily how these modes of practice are relevant right now and, and, and ways that we can like imagine a path forward for them. I think I would also add that. I think as Tom was sort of reflecting on device theaters, maybe one of the, the forefronts of the future is of the theater that we're making now is there is a desire for like collectivity that we can't necessarily get when we're watching a movie on our couch, right? This is back to the conversation of why theater is important to us at all. I think the process of making this that is related to collective creation and these historical practices is also how we might be able to move forward as our sort of desire to be back in the world and back in community is uh, reigniting and also complicating in, in our current political climate. Yeah, and I think one of the other things I was thinking about hearing everyone speak was that how, I mean, one way to frame the question is well, how has COVID impacted the actual practice and maybe in the narrow sense, Devise ensemble theater practice, but the other way is to reverse it: is how does the how do these practices reach out to beyond the theater into communities and into society and into uh, larger um, social relations and political questions? Uh, how do we impact the world beyond you know, the theater makers or the theater um, insiders or whatever the, the, the pre-existing audience, pre-existing community of makers, and um, you know, are there in fact opportunities emerging to have a bigger impact out rather than um, focus on how these uh, stresses in the world are hitting inside, you know, the silo of the work of theater making and teaching. 
And one of the points I emphasized in the Institute and I and in the, my contribution to the, the Yale theater magazine coming out is um, I think a lot of the solutions that I see that we are that, that where possibilities may be greatest if we understand them properly are through the channels of subsidy if possible in higher that exists already in higher education that higher education may be the crux that it's a little understood thing how much we subsidize the arts through higher education in the United States in a way that no other country on earth does and it's a lot of money and it's 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 not centralized it's not top down it's not coordinated it's evolution is very um uneven but in reality, it adds up to an awful lot of subsidy goes through into the arts through higher education, and that the higher education has historically performed all these functions of presenting, incubating, teaching, training, uh, providing, and, and, and providing an anchor in an environment defined under an increased, especially an increased in neoliberal environment, uh, an alternative to the precarity of um, our, uh, uh, independent artistic life professional in the United States, which is different than in other environments globally. Um, but I do think and it's where I've been, I work in, and uh, I think I've only been able to be in theater in a certain sense because I've been linked. I figured out my working relationship with higher education and I was able to arrive in places where I could uh, access resources deeply there to maintain a relationship with the artists that I was interested in writing about in the United States and elsewhere. But I think it's really, uh, important way to think about the future of how to maximize and prioritize maybe better and differently how we use the resources of higher education which are not always ample like in your environment you don't feel like you're in a, a highly resourced environment um, and you're trying to introduce students to these these opportunities or, or these artistic possibilities and that's real too um but it's also global, overall the arena of higher education is an extremely significant one and often is not included in the conversation of the profession um how to understand what's like going forward yeah and i feel like um that paradox of uh another paradox i feel that i experience on the daily is where i'll i'll, I'll feel so um I look around i feel we're so cash strapped i'll be like oh, there's so much we could do with more of a budget um but i also think that talking about this infrastructure that you're referencing i mean if, uh, in a way, there is such abundance for the students where they see it as like the pinnacle of their creative life and they're just wondering how they can sustain it beyond graduation. Um, yeah, and returning to an earlier uh, thought, it does feel like uh, teaching devised uh, work in the past few years, uh, you do feel a certain essential element where um, to the work, uh, where it feels like it's meeting a very uh, deep need in students, which is very rewarding and and awesome, and then you're like, how can how can I then? So they so they like making it themselves, and how can I connect them to what's going on outside? Um, but it is interesting that in, in hearing students' feedback on this kind of theater, they almost link it with somatics mm -hmm. and yoga and other things that like feed <laughs> their souls. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. They're like, how can we have more courses like this? Like maybe there's just somatic, and I think that's interesting. And that was the physically based yeah. piece of this. Right. Yeah, that that for them is foreground. But they were they were almost thinking that the, the generation of one's own generating one's own work is a kind of um, self-care and self-expression that they feel that they need right now. And then they connect that with other kinds of self-care, hmm. which I thought was very because the work is also very hard and very rigorous and about many other things, but um, but I think it speaks to how crucial it is right now, especially. Maybe we could open it up um, to questions or, or thoughts coming from the, the audience. And I don't know if we have a way to get it from anyone who's attending uh, the virtually, but um, are there. Um, what surprised you most? What you found? What, what, what surprised you most in your family? Mm. I think the scale of what we touch that that yes, this is 50 into the mic. Yeah, I said the scale of what we were touching by opening up this 
this is just the way we did that we have 50 participants and even that number i had to really sit down as i was writing the song to get the number right and that it was really 50 people at one point or another were in the room for the, during the 12 days and many most were the entire 12 days so then to realize that we had four times more applicants than we could take people who pursued it actively as an opportunity to be a participant and we had to close the doors to many people we knew very well because it couldn't be a Philadelphia. We couldn't over have Philadelphia, for example, over present. But Philadelphia, we could have filled the whole institute with just people doing this work in Philadelphia. Okay, so like when you start getting there, and then what are the when, when, when do these numbers begin to mean something like like nationally? I mean, but I do feel like those numbers keep surprising me. And how many graduates of the Pig Art School would pursue it if we invited them? How many? Members of the larger devising and interdisciplinary performance team in Philadelphia would, would perform simply, would participate simply locally if we did that. And then, uh, how many graduates of schools like Wilcock are in the country? There are a lot. Of the Del Arte School, there are a lot. Uh, there, there, that, and that people who didn't even have, for whatever reason, this isn't the time for them to apply, but we don't even know they're there yet. So I feel like I felt like we were touching the tip of an iceberg of uh, a community, and that is uh, dispersal nationally. Uh, that affirmed our hypothesis, I guess, that it really is a national phenomenon, and that we had participants from 19 states, and we are doing this, just a simple list of every company we can identify that does this work, and it's in the hundreds of companies. Um, Captain Sisayova, who was one of our faculty members, who wrote one of these foundational books on devised theater companies founded and led by women as part of the women's movement, has identified over a hundred devised theater companies founded and led by women. That's just one. That's one category over many, many years, and it's uh, and the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia started as one of those. That's the origin even of the name, and so. I guess that for me was what was affirming and, and, and beyond. It took me a while to take it in. I don't know about others. I don't know, Tom, are there things that you're finding in the material coming in that surprises you? Well, I don't know about surprises, but I know uh, that I um, have um, alighted on certain questions that have um, been interesting to think about based on what I'm seeing uh, the pieces people have drafted so far, and also what I was hearing in the discussions uh, at the Institute. One was sort of about sustainability, I think. You know, um, this, this is what we all want for the theater, and maybe this is the post-COVID piece. Um, we're trying to find a way to um, allow the theater to continue at all, and to make the work that we're doing in it um, meaningful and lasting. And, um, so much work could be classified as devised or collectively created, right? In a way, this is a like kind of problematic category, as it has been said many times, I think, in these conversations. You know, all theater is collectively created, and all theater is devised, after all. So um, what are we talking about? But if we, if the criterion for um, including work in that category is that it was made by um, a, in a sustained collaboration of some kind over time, we're talking about time um, when we talk about this form. We're talking about um, a form that has found a way to harness time and make it productive and make it um, meaningful, actually. So to me, this is a tremendously hopeful area to be thinking about in the theater right now. Um, if our other structures are failing us <laughs> because they're tied to some more capitalist um uh regimen of like convening a team of artists to make one show and then disband and um reconvene another team to make another show um this is an answer to that this is um this is a kind of um uh temporally charged um form and that's very um that's very interesting to me and just as i look across all the things that people are writing about the, the, all from a lot of different perspectives uh i've just been thinking about that a little bit and thinking that this is a very um very helpful side of the field to be nurturing yeah i think that's one of the for me also one of the contradictions that we keep bumping up against is where is it richer and 
and better? And where is it uh, that it presents itself as uh, poorer, simpler, and more efficient? Like that it can play into the neoliberal thing. Of, this is something you can do with less. This is something you, you need less time, less money, less budget. But in fact, the original origins of it are people saying we need less stuff, less richness in one way, but we well, the richness is time. And then the the the, the, uh, the enrichment of the process over time, and this is where in the the work I began with, which is just taking open theater work, that the revolution was to take eight months to create this sort of piece of serpent, and they gave up any interest in any other material uh, support to have the time to create the workshopping and the. Uh, an aesthetic that followed the, the the paradox of the richness was to have that amount of time to create a piece together. Um, the other example, which is contemporaneous, was Petoskey's early work, where it was like they were living very poorly in communist Poland in the 60s. They lived like uh, very modest graduate students as professional theater artists, and yet they in a very difficult city. And the, the, the shock when they encountered Chapin and his company was how much time they had the privilege to have to make their work, even as they lived under these stresses and duresses of communist life in Eastern Europe. So I think that so, and then I think when I to students like yours, like, like, how is it a solution to the problem of precarity and scarcity rather than a coping mechanism? And I see versions of devising where it is like, oh, it's efficient. It's apparently efficient. It's apparently uh, more budget friendly to do in an institutional setting. And I'm not sure those are the the um, being true to the impulses that are really behind. And yet, yeah, it's contradiction. Like, like how to have it's a search for that um, artistic other artistic categories, right? So, and I don't know how that connects with like and with what your thoughts are with what you're writing on now, but um, or uh, part of the also just to say, so the Institute invited the participants to do a, a Petra Kucha to do a short presentation on a company they wanted to make sure that everyone left aware of as an example of this work and maybe of a neglected uh, category of work in uh, scholarly literature or whatever. And um, the work that was brought in was extraordinarily interesting in every way. Um, and I don't know the, the work that you each brought in, the examples at all of what we're touching on now, or what you found when the other participants shared their things. I'll just say one thing that I really loved is that most of us um, refused the form of the Pachaki China. Yeah. Um, and said took our time. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting given the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I, I think maybe one of the things I'd pull out. Um, from what you were saying is we've now created this incredible network of people who are participants sort of nationwide and a little bit globally as well. And I think that network is both reflected in the piece of people have been submitted from the magazine. Some of that is photography work that has been developed into larger articles. Some of that is collaboration from people who didn't know each other prior to that. Some of that is looking at really specific networks, for example, the network of Philadelphia devising artists. And so I think the more that we can build on those networks, the more I think hopeful we can be about nurturing this form both in the academic and in, in the academy and professionally as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think these the bridge building like conversations or network building initiatives are really, really important. And people have been working maybe in more isolated ways or in a more siloed way than is good for the work or is necessary, and um would open up actually possibilities for everyone. Yeah. Maybe Mike, anybody has a question or a comment? If not, I ask another one. Um, so I think we mentioned that if I will support, do you have a rough number how much money goes if I'm looking at it into education towards the vice theater? And someone told me that about 15,000 students are being getting a degree each year in theater. You know, how 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 do you see what's available to them for career-wise and device theater and whatever? How many we train? Is the training right? And what happens after? Do you guys look at that? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have any numbers that I useful numbers about um, that you can identify students who are identified with revising. Um, this is the base work on some of it where you know, as they enter, as they end their education, so they may go forward. Um, it's usually a piece of the education uh, if it's there at all. And uh, then, yeah, what's the economy or what are the entry level things you can um, expect? Now, in a place like Philadelphia, we've had now for 25 years the Philadelphia Fringe Bus. So then we're actually talking about this right now. Quinn and I are having this conversation about in the program for the next festival to include uh, at least a day devoted to festival curating and people who are leaders and um, have long histories uh, in leading such organizations and how that the, 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 the benefit of having something like the Philip Fringe Festival in our environment, nothing would have happened really that allowed us for Pig Iron to come into being what it is for the department that's worth more to have the number of alums go on in the way that they could and have over time. Without that festival, I don't know, very little of it would have happened, honestly. The same way. So now we're realizing the importance of partnering between different kinds of institutional structures and the Philadelphia Fringe Festival is again, it's a not for profit uh, uh, organization that, but it's not an educational institution exactly, but they've been a very powerful partner synergizer support. And um, for that delicate phase of what you are doing the first few years after your first degree or MFA degree. Um, when you're trying things out, that's a really important time. And then um, the word I've been coming back to is incubating. Like, like how can higher education be an incubator for the students? And it also requires, frankly, a confrontation with certain bad practices in higher education. I don't want to present higher education critically. Um, What's there is practice. What would you say? You put the student at the center of everything, all the time. Is that hard? <laughs> It's really hard. I'll tell you in practice, it's really hard to honor with colleagues the practice of putting students at the center of the practice and the reason you're there and the reason ultimately you're justified as the professor is the work of the student. And that is not honored in many situations. You give us some example of what you feel is not right. Well, the, 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 the biggest example, and this is a typical and I would say the majority is the biggest uh, elephant in the room in most environments is the production program. How do you define productions? And I've had I mentored and uh, countless students going into teaching positions about how you constructively negotiate as an incoming faculty member your role in a production program. And then I've been talking to dozens of pig iron students as they look at jobs to talk about going in as a device first, coming from this type of training into a conventional theater department doing a season that's often meant to be a, to resemble at best the regional theater subscription season, which it's not, but it pretends it is. And then, or at worst, it's practicing just like old summer stock. It's like the mustiest of models. And then you come in and you have to find a way to work and succeed and um, be supported by your colleagues to keep your position while you're bringing in these new practices. So I feel like the reform, the constructive engagement and reform of the production season in uh, colleges and universities is critical. And frankly, it's worth more. I had to kill the entire idea of faculty production debt and start over. And then now we have a robust faculty production program that it can exist healthily with student-centered production. But if you don't open doors for students to direct, if you don't open doors for students to design, if you don't open doors for students to be playwrights as undergrads with meaningful support, and they're not competing with faculty for the budget, staff, or personal time, or so everything you need to be able to be successful in your year out of college, you're not doing that. And I very rarely see it actually being honored. And the actors, and I see actors and stage managers support it because they serve the interests of the faculty production program. And the, the student director doesn't, the wrong kind of faculty director does not see a student director as interested. And they don't see it as appropriate to give resources. And to even get a class or to even have a curriculum that's more than token or is that, that there's a class at all. And this is, we're still talking about the, the more traditional categories, directing, design, 
plug in Dunphy, then you move into devising. And then where does a devised project arrive in the season of a department? And then how do you, how can that student, how can a student go on and devise after their education if they've never had this range of uh, experiences, right? And that the resources are there to midwife that transition of the student first. That's really hard. And I don't think we can romanticize or sugarcoat the truth of higher theory of education on those issues. It's a huge, difficult fight. They're going things at UWCL right now. It's a large, rich, richly resourced, uh, venerable, large scale. Every grad student gets a full scholar, full fellowship with the stipend. Every grad student. It's always been true. It's only that to turn it towards advising is to turn that ship towards devising at the MFA level is what several of the people in our institute, both the faculty and participants, are engaged with. And even when you have several highly energetic, brilliant young faculty coming in together, it's really hard to turn the ship around. It seems to be happening. But um, there's so many embedded structures, and it's a place that has not been um attracting the best students as I for a while was one example. Now they really are, I think, do asking the right questions. Maybe next to Philadelphia, maybe each one of the panel. What is an example what you saw that works of a company or maybe an educational convention? I know, but every one of you, what is an example? We say this is how it should be. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think it's when I think about the, what we're writing about right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we can maybe talk about that together. Um, as a model that I think has been working for a really long time um, is queer collective making. Like this has been going on for a very long time. Um, it is a space not only in which um, I think queer, queer collective performance is interesting because it both um, exists within a community, maybe creates a community, shapes that community. It's like, like you can't really like kind of pull apart the idea of a community and making, right? Um, I find that to be like a really interesting, and, and, and also like there's a particular approach I think to history, um, both in making and preserving that happen in queer uh, collective performance. Um, and I think there's something also interesting about, um, and I know like the conversation about sustainability, like not having that sort of um, mean the same thing as doing more with less, but that's precisely what queer collective performance have been doing for a long time. Like, how can you make an entire costume out of tinfoil? Well, you can, right? I mean, well, it's also a, a medium that necessarily refuses the larger structure of the academy or the larger structures of uh, regional theater performance or whatever. We're refusing to hear theater makers are not, or performance makers are not welcome in those systems, so they created their own, that also are a development of community and kinship structures that are reflected in that performance. If you're thinking about drag families, which is the easy example of all of this, or um, how these various forms of performance are adopted into um, queer performance making. And so it's a system that both creates and refuses at the same time, usefully. What universities do that or? They don't. Uh, nobody does. You see, it should happen. No, I don't think it should happen. It's like the academy. I don't know what you think. I mean, I think some of the seeds of the academy, like I'm thinking of a particular device performance when I was at Minnesota University of Minnesota, there was a like queer industry. It was a device performance, yeah. which was, you know, so I think there are like little spaces, like little openings, but I think what's happening outside of those spaces is, is really the point. And I don't think we should be withholding queer modes of making for our students by any means. I think it's um, part of the work of queer performance creators is figuring out how to work in opposition, even if the information you get is from your WGSS class or your theater class. How do you then make something that reduces that? Maybe to what are examples of kind of ensemble work or as you device theater? We see this is really a great outside of the metropolis. I have two thoughts on this. 
Um, so just, I, I, I think that um, theater departments have a lot to learn from dance programs because there's already a lot of devising in, in you know, choreographing, student choreographic work um, that happens every single season. Uh, and for whatever reason, um, students uh, aren't intimidated by the work of creating their own dance and departments aren't afraid of it. So that's amazing. And I think we have a lot to, to learn there. Um, uh, and I'm thinking of my Pachaca Um uh, So thinking of Teatro del Público from, from Cuba, which has been going since 1990 um, in all different kinds of uh, economic moments, uh, but they've just been working consistently and doing amazing work. Um, I want to incorporate a unit on their work into a course that I'm already offering um, for actors and dancers in collaborative creation, um, kind of using the, the tools uh, in, in the toolkit of this company. Uh, but it's there's a lot of like adaptation. There's there's uh, using um, you know the work of major Cuban playwrights and singers and reworking them and remixing them uh, in ways that are really relevant and pertinent to the Cuban theater going public now. Uh, they're just doing extremely well. I'm not the person to say exactly what is working about on it, but I, I, I'm very intrigued by this company and I want to really learn what is working in that toolkit because I feel like it has a lot to do with Queens. <laughs> and, and I think that we could make really, really, I think we could make really pertinent work utilizing some of their practices. Yeah. Yeah. Really I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. All right. Um, I'm curious um, about whether or when uh, in the Institute did your conversations turn to um, uh, invitation and distribution of the work for audiences of non practitioners, non trainees, people who are not necessarily uh, already critically invested in, in this kind of work. Because, um, I mean, I happen to believe that, you know, this work could change everything, um, but we have to convince everybody of that. I don't know that that was, uh, I don't remember that specific question, which is a really important question. Um, and thank you for it, but it's uh, being uh, a focal point of a discussion in, in this to, that we had, though I hope will be in the next. Um, I think it's a really fundamental question of, you know, what do we call it? Uh, 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 I guess, you know, I, audience development is the kind of like, I don't like that, <laughs> with everything that, that comes in with that term, but it's um, curating an audience maybe is better. And that's what the festival does. And we've seen this in Philadelphia with the French festival that, that um, audiences uh, learn and return based on experiences they didn't know if they would like, but you, but you have to get them to show up at all. So it's all those questions. Uh, subsidy is a really giant issue. Uh, again, some of these premises. Subsidy makes most of this type of work possible. But you can't have a runaway hit. You can't know what your maximum audience is if you are dependent on a grant for every single show to go forward. So I've said that I've been involved with Pig Iron in different ways from the beginning. I'm on their board. I know all the financial calculations or issues of such a company. And one of the things is that uh, there are certain examples where I feel very strongly they've never known what their maximum audience is for certain shows because the model is baked in to be something that they because and, and all of American non profit theater in effect is in the situation of you can't have a runaway success. And so, and then to have something that like, uh, and I do believe audiences can be shown something unprecedented in their experience and have them love it and be excited about it and have it catch up the virus. And then other people are going, you know, there's, I think that's what theater history shows over and over again it happens. And I don't see any reason that can't happen with this kind of work, but um, there are, we have to somehow square the circle of how to have a show be able to go uh, until the audience goes away, which commercial theater knows how to handle. They, that's that's uh, understood very well, but in this arena it's trickier. Um, and then, uh, yeah, festivals I think are really interesting. Uh, 
player in perhaps by a French computer affordable performances, accessible performances with artists that have audiences can feel comfortable jumping on. Can I add a critic's superficial observation to, <laughs> to your and uh, to your uh, to your uh, excellent answer? Uh, I think this is a great question because I think that the American theater has been in urban conversation for the last three years about how to reinvent itself. And the audience has often been impacted by in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that it just very recently noticed that and realized the audience has not been brought along. Um, one of the things that's always interested me as I suppose almost a professional spectator <laughs> uh, is that you go to see the work of, of, of a collective or a troupe or an ensemble or um, a devised company differently than you go to see uh, a play. Um, it's just a different mode of spectatorship. People go to see the group. Um, people go to be part of that collectivity. And that's actually very interesting that it's a different mode of spectatorship in a way. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in that if we were to lean into that and understand that a little bit better. Um, so I think it's potentially very exciting that it, um, it, it's a different reason to go, a different reason to be there, and it's a different feeling of um, attachment and um, community. I would also say, in addition, that the question of like how we bring this forward, I think, was very present in our conversations about archiving because so much of the history of these companies is lost or is in the jukebox under the bed. And so the question of how we preserve these histories in order for anyone to know about them at all, I think, was really present in a lot of the work we were doing. Yeah, and I think this discussion there really is a, a contribution, you know, towards the importance of this field, how to archive to talk about it. And I want to thank you all for coming. I hope. Um, maybe if you have additional questions, um, you know, you can talk right now. We start the next panel at 4.30, but you um, can continue. So really, thank you um, all for taking the time, also for creating the panel, you know, writing the application and putting it through. We all you know how much work that really is. It's often not looked at, but in Joseph's voice, idea, you know, of a social sculpture or the uh, engagement, so it's an artistic and um, um, activity you did. So really, thank you all for coming. At 4 30, we have our next panel. So, thank you, and please talk to uh, the uh, panel. Thank you all.